Good afternoon all, and welcome to Future Forum, the age of the driverless car. My name is Dino Vrinos, and I am the facilitator for today's discussion. And I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are currently standing. Today we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. We recognise and respect that their cultural heritage, sorry, we, we recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. I would like to welcome the Premier, the Honourable Jay Weatherall. I would like to also welcome the Lord Mayor of the City of Adelaide, the Right Honourable Martin Hazy, Kirstine McKay, Government Architect of South Australia, our panellists, and I'll take the opportunity to thank our sponsors who helped make today possible. So to our festival major supporting sponsor, Architecture Window Systems, to the event presenter, the Festival of Architecture and Design in association with the RAA and Novatech, and the support of Griefgler Anderson, Stylecraft and the Jam Factory. A bit sticky. There we go. So, but most importantly, I would like to thank you all for attending today and participating in a conversation about big ideas. So as I said off the top, my name is Dino Vrinos. I'm an architect practicing at Greve Gillette Anderson. I am the fortunate recipient of the 2014 Jack Hobbs McConnell Traveling Fellowship in Architecture, and I'm one of three creative directors of the Festival of Architecture and Design, or FAD. I'd like to take a short moment just to talk about FAD and provide some context around today's event. So FAD was created a little over 12 months ago to encourage an open conversation about the value of architecture and design in South Australia and to provide our profession with a platform to engage with the wider public and each other. In 2014, we held 12 events, and this year, Future Forum is the final of some 40 plus events we will have enjoyed over six days. FAD presents an opportunity to discuss how architecture and design contributes to all aspects of our daily lives, and to think about the processes and the people involved in creating the spaces and objects around us. It allows us to highlight that architectural and design services are worth economic investment in creating sustainable communities and provide long-term benefits for future generations. FAD allows us to talk about the fact that design is a process. It's not just simply about the aesthetics. I can't stress that enough. And also to celebrate that South Australia has a rich history of good design and innovation. To help us spread these key messages, the creative team wanted to champion what is the South Australian way. And ultimately, we came back to the Thinkers in Residence program. Charles Landry, in particular, some time ago, talked about an edge condition. And we thought this would be a good way to capture what shapes our state. If we look at South Australia geographically, economically, socially, we're on the edge. And it's on the edge when you're at your limit that innovation happens and the creative industries can be at the forefront of that. This could not be more relevant today with our current condition in this state. Changing global and local economies are pushing us to the edge and forcing us to adapt. And this is why we are here today, to discuss the advent of the driverless car, the opportunities it presents to our state and the role that architects, designers, engineers, urban planners will all need to play in facilitating this new age. This event also serves as a teaser for the International Driverless Car Conference and Southern Hemisphere First testing of autonomous vehicles on our road in November. Looking further ahead, Future Forum is also a precursor to the 2016 National Conference in Architecture, where over 1,200 architects from around the country and the globe will descend on Adelaide in April next year. It has been more than 20 years since the last time the conference has been held in Adelaide, and the theme of how soon is now will have a distinctly South Australian flavour, presenting similar subject matter to that of today's event. The conference will explore the agency of architecture to make real changes to the world, empowering architects to participate in the massive transformations that are occurring in our cities, in global as well as local societies, and sustainability of our planet. And so, with that, we begin. The origins of this event can be traced back to a five-hour bus trip between Jinan and Jingdao on the Premier's delegation to China in May, earlier this year. I was fortunate enough to be involved in a conversation which was initiated by Andrew Roberts from the Water Industry Alliance between a whole range of well-credentialed, influential South Australians about, the, about driverless car technology. By the time we disembarked, there was a sense of optimism from all involved that the potential, the, the, sorry, there was a sense of optimism about the, the potential this technology presented for our state in a way that it could reinvigorate our economy and serve as a catalyst for a new age of prosperity in our state. It is my hope today to undertake a reenactment of sorts of that bus trip. 
So, we will begin with addresses from the Premier and the Lord Mayor who will outline their ambitions for the driverless car and what it might mean for South Australia. Following that, we will have a crash course, sorry for the pun, in driverless car technology from people at the forefront of what is happening in South Australia, as well as internationally. And then our panel of experts will discuss a number of hypothetical scenarios and I, and I will encourage you, the audience, to engage in that conversation as well. And so with that, I would like to introduce the Premier of South Australia, the Honourable Jay Weatherall. Thank you, Dino, and congratulations uh, for creating this festival and in particular this forum. Uh, can I also thank the Right Honourable Martin Hazy, Lord Mayor of Adelaide, for hosting this particular forum uh, in his beautiful Adelaide Town Hall, to Kirsteen uh, McKay, South Australia's Government Architect, uh, to David Homburg, President of the South Australian Chapter of the Australian Institute of Architects, and um, to congratulate the Institute of Architects for uh, putting this festival in this important time of the year, uh, where we have ambitions to create something in spring like we have in autumn, uh, Mad March really has taken over the autumn period and we want to create a cluster of festivals and events uh, in, the, uh, in the spring uh, part of uh, the calendar. And interestingly, they seem to be congealing around this notion of design and aesthetics. So at the moment we've got uh, the incredible Tarn Dandi, uh, the beautiful Aboriginal Visual Arts Festival, which is happening as we speak. Uh, soon we'll have uh, the Adelaide Fashion Festival, and of course this uh, architectural design festival. So we want to crowd it so that it, it does feel that there's a lot going on in this period so we create that same vibe. So congratulations to contributing to, to that effect. I'd also like to acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we acknowledge their relationship with uh, their country. This is um, a particularly topical um, forum I remember back in February when we announced the notion of us pressing down this direction of driverless cars, it was met with some scepticism and mirth as new ideas are sometimes met uh, with Ian Adelaide by certain sections of uh, uh, the community. Uh, but but it's, it was born in precisely the same way that Dino suggested. We, we realised that we need to do new things in new ways in South Australia to pursue what the new economy looks like. And so I challenged my transport minister to, to put something into the governor's speech in February that spoke to that, and he came up with driverless cars. And yes, I almost fell over, but we did include it in the, in the speech. And while there was some laugh and merriment at the time, since that time, it's actually captured people's imaginations. And uh, it really is, uh, upon further analysis, a much more developed and exciting proposition than, than many in the community would, would first imagine. Uh, in a week where we've seen an extraordinary loss of life on our roads, it promises in its full implementation to be a game changer in relation to road safety. Uh, in, a, in a week when we're looking at the destruction of old industries and the old economy, it promises to be the future in terms of the new economy, trying new things in new ways. But importantly for your conference, having a massive impact on the urban form, uh, what, how we travel, uh, how we live, and the buildings that actually are associated with our transport corridors. Because the truth is, all around us, the urban form is massively influenced by our mode of transport. Uh, and in fact, many of the challenges that we're seeking to really uh, unscramble now are the product of the, the motor car in its present form and the way in which that's constructed um, large suburbs on the edges uh, of our communities, which uh, really have meant that many people have become disconnected from each other and from their employment uh, and from the other services that they need to sustain themselves. So this really promises to be uh, a game changer in terms of the urban form. So it's entirely appropriate that uh, this particular institute of architects who are committed to design, and more importantly design thinking, uh, to be exploring these matters. So thank you very much for thinking about this. So the driverless car um, might have seen once the, the stuff of science fiction, but the pace of technological change 
Um, plus, the, the actual level of investment in this concept has meant the driverless car is very real indeed. Uh, in fact, you'll see elements of your vehicles now which are, in fact, already automated. It's really a continuum of those things, you, the automatic braking systems and those sorts of things which are, and even, you know, the, the reverse parking into, into spaces. We're beginning to see the automation of our existing vehicles. So it is here and now, it's not just the future. So we in South Australia want to be and can be present at the commercial birth, uh, not merely of the vehicles themselves, but potentially of a whole new industry. It's predicted that the international driverless car industry will be worth $90 billion within the coming 15 years. And the sector's remarkable momentum is the result of Google and most of the big car makers, including General Motors, BMW, Volvo, Tesla and Mercedes, investing heavily in this new technology. The automotive sector has been, as many people would be aware, central to our state's growth and identity for pretty much 100 years now. And certain sections of South Australia have very much taken their identity from uh, the, the car industry. I can remember seeing statistics um, back 20 or 30 years ago where in Western Adelaide, one in five people was employed in the car industry. It's 20% of all employment associated with the car industry. It's, a, it's nothing like that now. But this has had an effect on the psyche of South Australians about what they think their opportunities are for the future. So as that changes, we need to think about new ways in which we can engage the community. It's a story that stretches way back to when uh, the Holden Company, which I just think over in East Terrace, at one stage um, evolved from making horse saddles into making cars. And we know vehicle assembly will soon be coming to an end in South Australia, but that doesn't mean that we've lost our expertise, our capability or ambition when it comes to transport or cars. I see this as being superbly placed to have a major role in developing the technology that goes into driverless cars, in testing the vehicles and to one day building them, but importantly, to explore the urban development implications of them. I mean, we have an ur a beautiful urban form here uh, which has been bequeathed to us through uh, wonderful planning um, well over a century, almost two centuries ago now. And uh, it provides a fantastic test bed for the opportunities that present themselves by this new technology. I'm keen for us to become embedded in the industry early because it fits perfectly with our state's overall strategic direction. We are seeking to transform ourselves uh, from an old to a new economy, a process that brings with it both destruction and creation in equal measures. And that's unnerving for the people that are in the destruction part of it, but very exciting for people that are in the creation side of it. And they can be the same people, but they won't be the same people without our help and assistance. And this is where the role of government comes in. First, to show people what the future looks like, but then to assist them to, to travel that journey from uh, the past to the future. So as part of this, uh, it's the assertion that we strongly believe in that manufacturing is not dying. It's just a different form of manufacturing that will have a future. We still need to make things. It will just be that we'll be doing it in different ways. It won't be old metal bashing. It will be advanced manufacturing. So we want to be um, part of this shift uh, that will not only be a shift into advanced manufacturing, but also technologies that address... Uh, the imperatives of our age, which is a cleaner set of technologies. Indeed, my recent and continuing calls on the federal government to build uh, naval ships and submarines here in Adelaide speak to this ambition. I mean, these are the most sophisticated things that can be built just about anywhere on the planet, um, including space shuttles. And so we, if we're told we can't be in metal bashing and, and making unsophisticated manufactured products because they should go where labour is cheap, um, and if we're told we can't build the most sophisticated thing on the planet, then what is it that we're allowed to build if you believe that advanced manufacturing is part of a balanced uh, and mature economy? And we strongly believe uh, in an advanced manufacturing future. Indeed, if you look around the world, those economies that weathered the global financial crisis best 
countries like Germany have an advanced manufacturing capability. When they're not, com when they're not worried about uh, their exchange rate and that bouncing around, they're not worried about commodity prices and that bouncing around. They have a product where they're competing on value uh, and uh, it provides them with strong, stable, uh, well-paid uh, employment into the future. So that's why we want to pursue an advanced manufacturing future for our state and indeed for our nation. The document we released last year was uh, our economic plan for South Australia, South Australia's economic priorities. There are 10 of them. It is a roadmap to a prosperous high-tech future. But the priorities that are directly relevant to driverless cars are being a knowledge state and commercialising our research into industries which have a future. So a, a very strong relationship with our university sector, encouraging a diverse student population here, which has its own benefits, but also turning that knowledge into jobs and opportunities. Fostering growth through innovation, doing new things in new ways, always trying to add value uh, is another of our economic priorities. And um, promoting South Australia's international connections and engagement, always looking outwards beyond the borders of the state to the opportunities that exist elsewhere. I mean, the truth is we're 1.7 million people in a country of 23 million. First we need to be doing is looking out to the nation around us. Then we need to be looking out to the world around us. And for once, we're located in the fastest growing part of the world. So it's not a question of looking wistfully over to the United Kingdom or the United States. The fastest growing part of the world is on our doorstep. And uh, we, we need to uh, explore the, the wonderful connections that, that proximity gives us. Uh, and the relationships that we've formed over many decades now uh, to offer ourselves as part of the solution to many of the challenges the world faces. There's another imperative pushing us towards um, involvement in embryonic industries like driverless cars, and that's, of course, the imperative to address climate change and reduce our collective energy footprint. I'm very pleased that uh, the Lord Mayor is uh, with us here today because... I know he shares my view that South Australia can build on the leadership that we've already demonstrated in this area of public policy. Together, the State and uh, Adelaide City Council are committed to establishing an Adelaide Green Zone, so the first city anywhere in the world which is carbon neutral. It's a realistic ambition. Nobody's got there yet. Copenhagen have ambitions to do it. Melbourne have ambitions to do it. But our ultimate goal is to be first and to use that to project an image of this state and nation to the world. And this is an incredibly important ambition for us because it speaks directly to the sort of South Australia that we want to project on the world stage. The truth is we live in a very competitive global economic system. Everyone in my position or in the Lord Mayor's position is trying to promote their city or state. They're all out there saying, we're the best place to invest, we're the best place to visit, we're the best place to, to come and, and study. But you've, in that crowded international marketplace, this media-saturated society, you need to cut through with a powerful image. And what could be more powerful than to say that this is the city that has become carbon neutral first? Come and set up your business here if you want a low carbon footprint. Come and live here if you want to experience clean air, clean soil, clean water. Come and live here if you want not only the economic offering but the ethical offering that exists through an ambition of that sort. So together we're going to be collaborating on ways in which we can make electric and hybrid vehicles the preferred form of transport here in Adelaide CBD. And I think you can see the obvious connection between our promoting the use of these types of vehicles and our desire to be part of the driverless revolution. So I'm really looking forward to the coming few weeks because here in Adelaide we're going to be demonstrating our keen interest in driverless cars by hosting the first on-road trials of such vehicles in the Southern Hemisphere. On the weekend of the 7th of 8th of November, Volvo will test its self-driving cars on the Southern Expressway. So clear off. Uh, that's all I can say. 
No, it will be closed for regular traffic during the uh, duration. Um, and I'm especially pleased that uh, more than just providing the test track, South Australian experts and institutions will be practically, practically involved in the testing. Uh, the Adelaide Flinders and Carnegie Mellon Universities, the RIA, and a local company called Coda Wireless will all be taking part. Because the trials will be conducted in a controlled, closed off environment, there's no legislative impediment. But in anticipation of many more trials being conducted in South Australia in the years ahead, the state government is legislating to make broader real life testing possible on open roads. The Minister for Transport and Infrastructure, Stephen Mulligan, introduced a bill into State Parliament last month and we hope to have it debated and passed soon. Incidentally, the Minister recently travelled to San Francisco where South Australia was invited to join policymakers from around the world for a briefing by Google on its self-driving car concept. He was accompanied at that briefing by representatives of the Singaporean Ministry of Transport and Israel's Prime Minister's Office plus people from Japan, Taiwan and Sweden. This is truly an international effort. There was high praise from Google about South Australia's legislation to allow on-road testing of driverless cars. And as a result, other countries are now talking to us and considering the introduction of similar legislation. But unlike in some jurisdictions, our legislation won't restrict trials to test tracks and we won't require special permits. Anyone wishing to conduct trials will simply be expected to provide a plan of operation and ensure the trial maintains our excellent road safety record. Put simply, we believe trials should be as real life as possible. But there's no point in a driverless car that can navigate cones in a car park but is unable to navigate our busy streets. By being the first Australian state to introduce a framework for road testing, we're opening our doors to global players in the industry and creating opportunities for local firms and institutions. Indeed, many locals are already involved in this industry. For example, the firm I mentioned a moment ago, Coda Wireless of North Adelaide, has developed hardware and software being used in more than 60% of all vehicle-to-infrastructure and vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle trials in the world today. Coda is already working on software for a connected vehicle that's been made by General Motors, the Cadillac CTS, and is scheduled for release next year. Also, the University of Adelaide is leading our nation in the researching and testing of advanced driver assistance systems. And I should also mention that Carnegie Mellon, which has a campus just around the corner in Victoria Square, has a long history of involvement in self-driving cars. Many of the people leading driverless car initiatives at places like Google and Uber are graduates of Carnegie Mellon. The other positive aspect of the trials being conducted on the Southern Expressway next month is they'll coincide with our hosting of a major international conference on driverless cars you heard about earlier. So technical experts, public and private sector leaders, academics, researchers and engineers will all speak at this event. It will also involve demonstrations down at the Tehran Spray Crown in no involving automated vehicles, driving simulators and Volvo automated parking systems. So overall, I believe the upcoming Vovol trials will help place South Australia ahead of a driverless technology curve and connect us to this dynamic new industry. It will also complement the work we're doing to reduce uh, road congestion, such as through the use of our Bluetooth traffic monitoring technology. So ladies and gentlemen, the driverless car has arrived and as a result, we're really on the cusp of one of the largest IT advances since the Model T Ford made car ownership possible for the masses. I predict that worldwide interest in the driverless car and the process of fully commercialising the product will grow exponentially in the years ahead. And there's obviously enormous potential for our state and uh, for the future for our ambitions to be a high-tech economy and an even better place to live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Premier. I'd now like to ask, oh, I went too far, back. The Honourable Martin Hazy to say some words as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dino. 
I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting on Ghana land and we honour the connection of the tra traditional custodians of the land, both past and present. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Town Hall. Welcome to Town Hall in our 175th year, and I'll chat about that a little bit later, but uh, welcome to the Festival of Architecture and Design, which is terrific. Premier, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Wonderful to see you. And uh, John, the Honourable John Hill, I think I saw. John, nice to see you. Welcome. Kirstine Mackay, South Australian Government Architect. Uh, Megan Adcliffe, uh, David Homburg, Dino. Ladies and gentlemen, guests, welcome. It's lovely to have you here. The, um, I'd like to talk about Adelaide as being a uh, city of firsts. And I think this is one of our golden opportunities. If 1906, I think it was, the first driver's licence in Australia, in fact, was issued in Adelaide to a fellow called Dr William Hargraves. Many of you may have heard that story, but I think this is certainly building on that story, isn't it? That in 1906 we had the first driver's licence issued and in 2015 we're going to have the first driverless vehicle trial uh, on South Australian roads. I think that's a great story to tell and I think it's a, uh, an incredibly important story to tell for South Australia. There's a quote that I uh, fished out from Albert Einstein and it reads, logic will get you from A to B, imagination will take you everywhere. And I think that's what this is all about. This is all about harnessing everyone's collective imagination in terms of what this brave new world could be. I remember that discussion in May in Shandong province and uh, there was a lot of excitement about this opportunity to have this conference, to commence this initiative, to commence this discussion in Adelaide. And it's true, when you first hear it, it's very Jetsons-like. Uh, that whole concept of uh, driverless vehicles in terms of that's a brave new world indeed. It's a brave new world indeed. But it's an incredible opportunity, given that the major manufacturers will have these vehicles in their showrooms anywhere between 2018 and 2025, and many of them, uh, many of them. So if we are to be the city of firsts, if we are to reach out and be the innovative city, not only in Australia, not only regionally, but globally. This is precisely the type of thing that we need to embrace with open arms to drive our society, to drive our commerce, to drive our economy forward. This is absolutely critical. So I think this driverless vehicle opportunity uh, for the city and, as the Premier said, for South Australia is social, it's cultural, it's economic, it's technology, it's employment, it's education, it's environmental, it touches upon so many things which we are looking to achieve because they're all interconnected. And that's the important part. They're all interconnected. Nothing happens in isolation anymore. All of these matters are self-reliant upon the other. I think it also speaks to a bigger picture. I think it speaks to our confidence and I think it speaks to our psyche. I think it speaks to our ability to retain and attract the best and the brightest to Adelaide. I think it speaks to our brand. Our brand as a city, our brand is a state. We have a great state brand. Welcome to South Australia. Open the door to opportunity. Uh, surely this is one of the greatest opportunities we can have in front of us. It's critical. Um, we also need to look at what driverless vehicles in all of their forms mean to city design and city planning. And when I came back from Shandong province with the Premier in May, I immediately started asking those questions internally of our design team in terms of, what are we doing? What are we doing to prepare for what potentially could be a very brave new world? What are we doing in terms of the planning of our city streets? What does that mean to our transport infrastructure? What does that mean to our digital infrastructure, just as importantly? Um, like the Premier said, this is also deeply interconnected with the education sector and also with research and development with our universities. Um, it's a leadership piece. Uh, it's very much a leadership piece across so many sectors. Um, through our work as a smart city, our growing entrepreneurial e ecosystem and our commitment to carbon reduction, the City of Adelaide is developing a global reputation in this space, certainly for innovation. Driverless vehicles are certainly a conduit towards taking us there. The, uh, our manufacturing sector, as the Premier rightly stated, is going through a period of transformation, and this is precisely the new types of technologies that we can be manufacturing. Maybe there's an opportunity here for South Australia to lead the way in battery storage technologies and manufacturing because, of course, these vehicles are 
highly likely, if not entirely, going to be electric powered. And battery storage technology is a area, uh, we've got the ability to capture the energy, we now need to store it. And battery storage technology is going to be that. Adelaide also has the nation's largest free public Wi-Fi network. And this is critical, this is absolutely critical because that is the enabler of uh, driverless vehicle technology and beyond. Uh, we pioneered this in conjunction with the government and uh, Canberra uh, was the second city in Australia to adopt it and uh, you wait, it will just be a matter of time before this becomes the national standard. We have uh, what's called lighthouse city status with global tech giant Cisco and we work with Cisco already around smart parking innovation technologies, environmental sensors and traffic movement analytics. So this is really quickly already becoming part of our DNA as a city. It's very, very important. The, the environmental goals, um, the Premier spoke very rightly about the absolute important and gravitas that we can, as a city, secure by being the first, uh, the world's first carbon neutral city. What does that do to our brand? What, does that, what signal does that send to the world? One of the fastest growing areas of the global investment community is ethical investment. And there is, this is an area whereby we can have companies choosing to set up in Adelaide because we're the first in that space. We can have people wanting to work in Adelaide because we're the first in that space. And of course we want to grow our city population. We want to grow our city population. We're currently at 22,700. We're rising at about 750 a year. We have an opportunity to double, if not treble, that growth. And I would suggest that within the next year you're going to see some fruit of that because we're already, because of the consequence of the interest of a considerable amount of apartment construction and residential dwelling construction and greater demand from younger people and other segments of the market, more people want to live here. And that's because of the vibrancy factor. That's because of the vibrancy factor and because it's a great place to live. These things, as I say, are all interconnected and that's what's important. Safety. Uh, Premier, and we've all heard the news over the last week, it's, uh, it's fairly dire and no one likes hearing that type of news. Uh, when a, a motorist or a cyclist or a pedestrian or anyone is involved in a tragedy like that, it's not good for society, it's not good for us, it's not good for families. But uh, these vehicles uh, can take us a quantum leap quickly into the future, into a safer future. A safer future for pedestrians, a safer future for cyclists, and a safer future for motorists. These things, as I say, are all interconnected. In fact, uh, paradoxically almost, the, because of the ability of driverless vehicles to travel within relatively small distances of each other, they will create more space on our city streets. They will create the opportunity to widen our footpaths. They will create the opportunity to make Adelaide even more walkable than what it already is, make it even more pedestrian friendly. Uh, more cosmopolitan, more outdoor than what it already is, without necessarily compromising the ability of us to bring people in and out of um, in and out of the city. Interestingly, I'd encourage you to think about this type of scenario: that if your driverless vehicle was to take you to work, it could possibly also earn you an income. It could drop you off at work, and it could become a it could become a personal transport vehicle of some sort and earn you an income while you're at work, you could get back into it at the end of the day and it could tell you it's earned you $322, you can smile and give it a pat and it could take you home. So that just illustrates that the opportunities here are just, they're almost infinite and we don't even know what the technologies are going to be as a consequence of us embracing this and I think that's exciting. Uh, we don't know what kind of jobs could be. Uh, generated as a consequence. We don't know what kind of apps could be generated in terms of communications. All of this will come. Um, I had 10 academic reports put on my desk last week from universities around the world, all uh, espousing the benefits in different forms, from city making to safety to commerce to investment attraction. Uh, and I read them all over the weekend. And it is fascinating stuff. But it's real. It's absolutely real. The, so we could actually reduce the number of cars on our streets but increase the number of people. And that's an extraordinary outcome. We could improve safety. We could improve our carbon emissions. We could reduce them. All these things are interconnected. The 
What does that mean to car parking? This is an interesting one. These are the questions I'm asking internally. Uh, Adelaide City Council owns 10 car parks. Uh, Adelaide City has more car parks per capita than any, any other nation in the country by a mile. What does that mean? What does that mean in five years' time? What does that mean in 10 years' time? Will car parks be needed at the level that they are now, on street and off street? I don't know, but these are the types of questions we need to start thinking about. And these types of conferences are absolutely critical for us to start thinking about these matters now. Very, very important. If we can, if we can reclaim our streets for people, for cafes, for businesses, for residents, for tourists, what does all that mean for our city? What does that mean for our riverbank? Victoria Square, Rundle Mall, Central Market, all these wonderful places in our city. I think it's all going to change for the better, which is absolutely wonderful. Traffic lights. Will we need traffic lights? I don't know. Do driverless vehicles need traffic lights? Interesting question. Um, people do. We just got... It's such a brave new world. The, these kind of combination of safety, digital infrastructure, employment, uh, uh, brand, reputation, investment attraction, global investment funds, positioning of Adelaide locally, nationally, globally... Um, this really, I think, has the makings of being the opportunity of our lifetime, which is extraordinary. So, I wonder, maybe driverless vehicles is the missing link that we've all been looking for, to sew all of these seemingly disparate things together into creating a very, very different, but a very, very exciting and a very, very prosperous city for the future. And maybe the, pro the productivity gains, even. I mean, I'd love to get in my car and do some work, make a phone call, relax, have a cup of coffee. I don't know what I'm going to do in there, but I'm not driving it. So I'm doing other things. So my own personal productivity goes up. So um, well done to the organisers. This is a crackingly good idea. It's a great conference, and it's these kind of conversations which we need to start now together to grab this opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much to both the Premier and the Lord Mayor for their their words. It's very encouraging for me as a young person in South Australia to hear that kind of support for the things that I advocate for. So now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce up on stage um, and I'll invite all the guest panellists to come up and, and grab a seat on our large lounge. Um, so first of all, Mark Wallace. You can all come up together if you want. Otherwise, people will be seeing them by themselves for a little bit. So Mark Wallace. So Mark has worked for the RAA. There we go. So Mark has worked for the RAA for over 30 years in various capacities, including that of, R of the RAA's chief engineer, after which he took over full responsibility for the vehicle technology area and mobility. He currently heads up the Mobility and Autom Automotive Policy Group, which formulates policy for all areas that affect mobility. Mark has a wealth of knowledge on a range of motoring-related issues and is a well-regarded commentator on the industry. Matthew Layson. Matthew is a project managing the state government step to, steps towards the future of driverless vehicles operating on our roads through the delivery of the first conference and on-road demonstrations of driverless cars in the Southern Hemisphere this November. Matthew's current role includes the design and delivery of road safety policy in South Australia in the genres of safer vehicles and safer speeds. Matthew has a strong history and knowledge of automotive and intelligent transport systems and has achieved success in the management of both heavy and light vehicle fleet management within the state government. Rita Excel is the manager of the ARRB Group's South Australian office and is currently undertaking the role of South Australian business manager for the ARRB Group's driverless vehicle initiative, which includes representation and coordination of 27 partners across technology, vehicle and research organisations, including seven partners from South Australia. During her time at ARRB, Rita has been responsible for managing key relationships with the State Road Authority and various local governments in South Australia. Rita has over 15 years of experience in strategic transport planning and road safety. So that makes up our driverless car expert panel component. So next to our architects, Megan Ancliffe. Megan is an architect with 15 years of experience in commercial development across the disciplines of urban design, landscape and built form. She currently directs strategic projects and innovation for South Australia's Department of State Development. Megan is responsible for the $253 million Tonsley redevelopment, leading a unique cross-agency delivery team transforming the 61-hectare ex-Mitsubishi manufacturing facility to a mixed-use precinct and a platform for industry and development and innovation in Adelaide. 
Megan has worked with the South Australian Government Architect and the Integrated Design Commission and continues her involvement with the now Office of Design and Architecture South Australia, ODASA, as a member of the inaugural Capital City Design Review Panel. Megan is also a director of the Cooperative Research Centre for the Low Car sorry, Centre for Low Carbon Living and chair at Adelaide Living Laboratories. David Homburg. David is a principal of Hassel and leads Hassel's Adelaide Studio. With a focus on the overlap between education, workplaces and urban spaces, he has led the briefing stage for the development and building of Flinders University's School of Computer Science, Engineering and Mathematics at Tonsley and has undertaken similar works for the University of South Australia. He is also team leader for the SA Waters new headquarters in Adelaide. His master planning experience has included input to award-winning Bowdoin to the award-winning Bowdoin Urban Village Master Plan in Adelaide, and in his capacity as an Australian Institute of Architects SA Chapter Councillor, he has sat on the steering committees for several urban forums, including the Adelaide Thinkers and Residents, Fred Hansen Residency, and Built Environment Meets um, Parliament SA. David is also currently the President of the SA Chapter. And finally, Cameron Bruin. Cameron is a writer, editor, and publisher of architecture, landscape architecture, and interior design media. Cameron holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Queensland and is the Editorial Director of Architecture Media, Australia's leading cross-platform publisher and events organiser for the built environment community. He is also Creative Director for This Public Life, the 2015 Festival of Landscape Architecture, which will be held in Melbourne on the 15th to 17th of October, which is this week. So thank you for coming down. <laughs> With Sam Spur and Ben Hewitt, he will also direct the 2016 National Architecture Conference in Adelaide from the 28th to 30th of April in 2016 with the theme of How Soon Is Now. And with that, I'd like to invite Mark to come up and talk about the future of driverless cars. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, Today, I suppose, really what I want to do is give you a bit of a snapshot of, of what some of the implications for this technology uh, may be for architects, urban planners, those that uh, build the built environment. Uh, we call them driverless cars, but they also go by self-driving cars, which is uh, less confronting to some people than thinking of a car without a driver in it, and autonomous cars. And just for you to get your head around some of the, the terms, autonomous cars are cars that have all the technology on board that can go from one place to another. Connected, connected cars are cars that can talk to each other and can talk to the infrastructure. And the combination of both systems, an autonomous vehicle that can also talk to the infrastructure and other cars is, and cooperating is the optimal, um, uh, optimal arrangement to have. And that's ultimately what we'll need to have for autonomous vehicles to really fulfil the the vision that you've heard from the, the Lord Mayor and the Premier about how these things might move independently. Um, the evolution pathway today started a couple of decades ago. If uh, we take away, if we broke the driving uh, task down into say 20 tasks, um, 15 years ago we started to give away the task of trying to keep the car at a constant speed. We gave that problem to the cruise control. Uh, more recently, reverse parking, we've surrendered that task to the, to the car, so it parks itself. Lane keeping is another task that we've given to the car, so it will keep itself centred. Progressively, the task that we don't like will surrender to the car to do. And so automation of this, uh, uh, this autonomous system will come gradually. They'll come, uh, they'll come uh, sort of exponentially towards the end, though, because most of the architecture for a lot of these technologies is already sunk into the car. It's about smart ways of using it and getting the external infrastructure working properly. Um, this pathway to the self-driving technologies, um, I won't spend too much time on it because I know one or two of the other speakers will probably go into some of this detail, but effectively uh, we're looking, still looking at time frames of full autonomy, you know, out to 12, uh, to, you know, 10, 15, probably 20 years. And um, uh, there's a reasonable amount of, as we've heard, a lot of uh, investment going on from the vehicle manufacturers in this technology. An example is, um, say, Germany's R&D budget uh, amongst the vehicle manufacturers there was, I think, uh, $36 billion a year, 19 of which last year was spent on this technology alone. So... The implications for these technologies, they will be disruptors, uh, especially for 
uh, people in the room here are building the built environment that uh, will have, uh, you know, lives of 20, 30, 40 years. And the sort of basic stuff that we're starting to see now is that uh, Mercedes have, have started the, uh, the uh, lead on this of trying to turn the, vehicle, the interiors of vehicles into pleasant places to be, preparing themselves for a time when these will be able to, on certain corridors, freeways, etc., uh, do the task of driving. And, um, and therefore, you know, is, is this technology going to increase urban sprawl when people are actually happy to live a long way out, when they can turn uh, that sort of time into, as Martin said, having a coffee or or, uh, or doing something more pleasant. So the unintended consequences of these, uh, we just need to think through because you may, in fact, uh, we, while we're working at one stage to try and uh, reduce our, uh, our uh, emissions, it could increase the vehicle kilometres travelled because people are actually happy to spend that time in cars. So it's going to be interesting, and that's what today's about, I suppose, just sort of highlighting these things for you guys to think about. Um, will autonomous vehicles be everywhere? Probably not for a while. They will uh, have a role in connecting vehicles to good public transport systems that do cover the, the longer distances. And probably, if we're looking to how it might evolve in Europe, uh, a type of hub-and-spoke uh, interregional type uh, autonomous highway network. So what that means is um, uh, in, in low-speed environments, you might, might get uh, autonomous vehicles that uh, will transport you from public transport to home. So in a, uh, a closed uh, property development, you may elect to have it so that the only vehicles allowed are there are autonomous vehicles and they will pick you up from public transport that will take you much quicker to uh, the you know, work and places like that. Um, if you look, what, again, what's happening in Germany, they're really looking at a sort of an autonomous vehicle node, areas where these autonomous vehicles can, that know the environment can operate and will be connected by corridors that will allow them to, um, sections of freeway, to, to join each other. The bits in between will normally have to revert probably back to the driver for at least the next decade or so. Um, will we need smaller garages or parking spaces? To, to uh, answer the Lord Mayor's question, you know, this month uh, the new 7 Series will come out with what they've called a, a valet parking function. That is, you will be able to get out of the car and the car will go away and park itself. Um, that happening in the public space is a fair way away and it's, main, it's not an engineering problem, it's a litigation, it's a law, it's a rule uh, problem about how you make it so that they can manage all of those interactions. But if you're building large residential properties or, or controlled uh, um, uh, gated communities, this is the sort of technology we, the, where the car knows the vehicle. You might be able to start that very, very soon. If that happens, then you, you, you need to be thinking about designing car park areas that uh, you know, literally can have cars so that the car park doesn't have to be wide enough to open up doors, etc. Um, but it, as again, it'll, it'll come uh, to private properties before it'll come to the, the public realm. Um, just a side thing, electric vehicles are, are paralleling this technology and increasingly their needs within buildings will, uh, will change as well. Um, inductive charging, which is the ability for a coil in the ground to charge the battery in a, an electric vehicle so there's no need for cabling, is starting to mature. And um, in the future, uh, apartment buildings or uh, uh, yeah, places like that will probably need to, at least in the electrical architecture, allow for this sort of stuff. Otherwise, in uh, 10 years' time, you might find you've got expensive retrofitting or, or vehicle... Or, um, uh, buildings that might not be able to be retrofitted. Um, will we need the same roads? It's a way off, but when we get down to 10, 10 centimetre GPS or vehicle location type systems, um, then you will be able to certainly sh uh, shorten up the, the travelling distances between vehicles, uh, up to probably one, th one third of it, or put it another way, on the same corridor you might be able to put down three times the traffic. Uh, you have, you'd be able to have narrower lanes. Um, the notion of will we need traffic lights is a real one. If, uh, if, if an example I might give is um, if, you, if you look at, uh, say, uh, Green Hill Road as a corridor, if the intelligence system knew enough of what vehicles were on the road and what speed they were doing, 
they'd be able to send signals into the car saying to the driver, if you slow down by three kilometres now, you'll get the next green light. Or it might say to some other, other drivers, if you speed up by three kilometres, you'll get the next green light. And what happens is you'll be able to pulse groups of vehicles down Green Hill Road as they all get the green light. Now, get that smart enough, and can, so you know all of the cars on the system, you can actually pulse groups of vehicles through intersections, so you actually don't need traffic lights. Um, you can have... Uh, uh, and, and the, the stuff to do that's already on the car. You've got cruise control there that will take these signals, and so it's not an engineering problem about how you uh, make sure that the car can manage that. It's about having the intelligent infrastructure around there to allow it to happen. Um, and, you know, at an extreme, do you need street signage if the car knows where it's going as well? Um, just as a side thing, uh, it's part of the acceptance of autonomous uh, vehicle technology is if people are just getting exposed to it. Uh, anybody who's been to Japan or a lot of uh, major cities now, a lot of the rail system, light rail system, doesn't have drivers. Adelaide uh, Airport are investigating whether they can run an autonomous vehicle uh, from the long-term car park to the, um, the shuttle, uh, to the terminal. But those are the sorts of programs that will gradually desensitise people to, you know, uh, hopping in a vehicle that doesn't have a driver. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is uh, we've talked about autonomous vehicles of the vehicles who run up and down the road here. Really, there's another level of automation that once you get a controlled environment, uh, especially within assisted living, as we've got an older group of people coming through, is whether you actually start to develop vehicles that can live within a uh, retirement precinct and do all of the functions uh, of a car, even into a shopping centre type pre uh, um, uh, precincts so that you, you have the mobility and the freedom these, uh, that uh, they otherwise wouldn't have or reliant on other people. So we're about to lead a work group to see if South Australia might be able to take a lead in this area. We know that, um, well, we not, don't know, we heard that Google are, uh, are uh, looking at this technology at a very large retirement village in Florida. Um, so uh, they see that as, you know, not just the, having an autonomous vehicle on the road, but off the roads and into, into to, uh, buildings in some instances. Um, our surveying of our members says there's still a lot of public resistance to uh, this technology, so it's going to take a bit of selling, and the trials that, that uh, the Premier and Matthew have arranged uh, to start that conversation with the public about how these technologies will evolve uh, is an important part of that sort of uh, dialogue, to, dialogue to change the culture. Um, how are we preparing for this technology? By getting interested partners together, um, Australia is very much uh, a receiver of cars, but some of the technology, the apps and the uses of these uh, is a op ripe opportunity for us to, uh, to exploit. And to that degree, um, uh, Rita from Arb will probably talk about later, the, the uh, driverless car initiative where she's been tr they've been trying to pull together all interested parties in, in, uh, in Australia from academia, from auto uh, automotive technologies to see what opportunities we can exploit as this technology rolls out. Um, they, the driverless cars on their way, are on their way, and you'll hear that from speakers, in various types of uh, uh, applications. And uh, the design of the built, spirit, the built environment really needs to provision for these future capabilities. And hopefully what we're going to tell you today at least is uh, the starting of some seeds of ideas that you might not have thought of, or it might be just a reaffirmation of what some already uh, are, um, are uh, building into their plans already. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And now um, I'd like to invite uh, Matthew Layson to come up, but before we do, there's a short video which we'll watch, um, which has been put together by Bosch, which might help you to visualise some of the things that we've been talking about. Welcome to our vision for a highly automated car and its unique driving experience. Although it looks like your common everyday car, a host of smart new features ensures that driving is no longer a chore. It helps to reduce the load on the driver by taking care of highway driving. Philip, a young professional, has been using his new car for a few weeks now. The car has been learning from his routines and can predict destinations. On selecting the destination, the car allows Philip to optimize his time by balancing the share between manual and automated driving.
As Philip sets off, he looks at the upper left corner of the instrument cluster, where the drive state indicator is located. It is a quick reference for the time left in the current driving mode. Apart from the regular navigation view, the split display provides Philip with an overview of his route. With this, Philip has a clear picture of where automation is available. He can access additional features with aid of the menu on the left. As he approaches the ramp to the highway, one of the maps switches to the top view so that he has a better view of his surroundings. After entering the highway, the drive state indicator communicates to Philip that automation is available. Also, two special buttons on the steering wheel start glowing. As Philip presses them simultaneously for three seconds, the car switches to automated mode. Philip can now confidently take his hands off the wheel as he knows that the car is in full control. With the free time in hand, Philip decides to get some work done and opens his office inbox via apps. For a better view, he moves the inbox to the top panel and goes through his unread messages. Philip can perform common actions by interacting with the on-screen buttons or with voice commands. He starts to dictate his reply to an email. It's not the same as working at his desk, but with the new car, Philip can be productive even while on the road. While on the highway, the car encounters a slower moving vehicle in front and sees an opportunity to change lanes. It communicates its intention by displaying a visual on the instrument cluster and a notification on the central display. If Philip wishes, he can select this notification to access the top view and monitor the maneuver. Once the car has completed the maneuver, Philip can rate it based on common driving parameters. This helps the car to learn his preferences and to improve its motion behavior for better comfort. Having taken care of all the important work, Philip still has some time left before taking back manual control. He decides to relax and watch a few online videos. When it is time for Philip to take back control, he is notified in steps. With a few minutes left, the drive state indicator switches to orange and then red, depending on the urgency of the situation. If Philip still doesn't take back control at this point, the car would find the next safe spot on the shoulder and pull over. Switching to manual mode happens in the same way as activating automation. As Philip presses the buttons simultaneously for three seconds, the car switches back to manual mode. On reaching his destination, the car provides Philip with some smart statistics on his journey. At a glance, Philip can compare the efficiency of the car in manual and automated modes, and also his savings. From being a mere mode of transport, the car has evolved to become a part of Philip's digital lifestyle. It allows him to be productive when he is on the move and can be relied upon for needs far beyond mobility. Um, so driverless cars, the future is now. That um, uh, little video from Tesla and Bosch was released in March this year. Um, and gives a good indication of what the, what the future around the corner is, is going to be like with some of these driverless cars on, on the freeway environment. Uh, media release from Tesla uh, this morning um, have announced they're rolling out uh, technology similar to that um, uh, through software updates to Teslas on the road um, as of this week. Um, so as we can say going forward is, is driverless cars, we don't really have that much longer to wait to get to some of these technologies. Um, the Adelaide demonstration on the 7th of November through the Australian Driverless Vehicle Initiative that a number of speakers have spoken about um, this morning um, is really the, uh, the first demonstration of, of a very similar technology to what you've just seen in, the, in that video with a piloted highway driving. Um, fully automated vehicles uh, will be here by 2020 and common and affordable by 2025. 
Some of the predictions uh, about uh, percentages of vehicle sales um, is, is somewhat difficult to predict going forward in the uh, times of um, uh, uh, the booming uh, information technology space and um, uh, disruptive technologies such as Google and, and the Ubers of the world. Um, however, the, the research we have seen have said by 2035, 9% of vehicle sales will be driverless. At 2055, 90% of vehicle sales will be driverless. Um, and when we say driverless, that means completely um, automated drive, driverless uh, vehicles with no steering wheels or no, no controls. Um, and as also said, said earlier, driverless cars are being tested by um, mainstream vehicle manufacturers. What is needed for the uh, driverless cars? Um, essentially three core things, which is the uh, control of the vehicle um, and the vehicle, vehicle dynamics. So building on the technologies that we've seen in our vehicles since the late 90s, such as electronic stability control, um, uh, steering control, and um, um, uh, the ability of the vehicle to um, deliver those uh, precise um, uh, control um, uh, manoeuvres that the um, uh, driver requires. Uh, sensing systems, uh, driverless vehicles require a lot of sensing systems um, to pick up not just what the vehicle can see in front of it, um, but what the vehicle can see around the, around the corners and what the vehicles are, are coming up to um, in the next suburb and the next street it travels through. Um, so what, what the, some of the sensing systems there are, are some of the local systems such as radar and 3D cameras and laser and ultrasonic sensors, and then broadening that to um, uh, the next generation of connectivity um, in looking at Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, 5G connectivity and also dedicated short-range communications which um, uh, the South Australian company um, Coda Wireless is certainly a leader on. Um, processing and decision making um, is, a, um, uh, is a big challenge for driverless cars and, and that's why um, uh, Google, Apple and Uber and so on are getting so involved in it. Um, the amount of data um, to process through a driverless car is, is huge. Um, some of you may have heard of that term, um, big data, um, and, that's, and you can certainly bring that to life when you drive down the southeastern freeway in the morning or your, your trip to work. Um, just imagine if all the vehicles around you were driverless and they're all connected, speaking to each other, uh, getting information on, on where those vehicles are going, information on what the traffic's doing ahead. There's a huge amount of data flowing around and a huge amount of processing power required in each of those individual vehicles um, to take control and um, um, change the direction of that car or apply the brakes um, or what's required. Even in today's um, uh, car sensing systems, um, in, in, a, in a base level vehicle you can buy off the showroom floor today, there's a myriad of, of sensors and technologies already fitted to that vehicle. Um, so driverless cars um, are tapping into those um, current sensor technologies and bring that to the, to the next level. Bringing driverless cars into the mainstream, as, as Mark spoke about, is certainly um, uh, a level of steps. Um, and I've, I've put a few timelines to those, uh, uh, those steps here. So we're currently in the, um, in the world of um, uh, no automation with some driver assistance warnings through to some driver assistance sy systems such as active cruise control and autonomous emergency braking. Um, when we move up to um, uh, uh, level two control um, to control um, specific drive modes such as um, uh, traffic jam assist and pilot highway driving, um, we're predicting that um, that sort of technologies um, will be out from um, uh, 2015, 2016 um, and start coming into the mainstream by 2020. Um, conditional automation through um, limited self-driving, um, through the, um, uh, the valet, valet parking experiences where you'd um, uh, take your vehicle to the entry of a multi-level storey car park, hop out, uh, the vehicle would drive itself through the boom gates and park itself. Um, that sort of technology um, is uh, on its way and um, predictions there is, is for that technology to be here um, later this decade. Um, high automation and full automation of um, uh, self-driving cars, whether the vehicle can be taken control by the driver um, or there'll be no driver controls of the vehicle. Um, uh, we're looking to those to come out from um, 2025 and onwards. Um, where does Australia fit within driverless cars? Um, uh, several pieces of research are, um, have been put out globally around um, um, Australia measuring some great positive attitudes towards driverless cars and in a, um, a good bit of uh, research put out um, conducted in UK, US and Australia, um, Australians recorded the highest positive um, opinion 
um, and were positive around driverless cars and the driverless future and, and comfortable with him um, sitting in a driverless car. Um, Australians have always been early adopters of innovations and new technologies and um, we're well regarded internationally for being at the cutting edge of innovation and also um, engineering and automotive design as well. Um, and a, um, a parting comment on this as well is, is 10 years ago, neither the iPhone, iPhone nor Android even existed. Um, today, three quarters of Australians own smartphones and it's increasing. So if we take that concept of the driverless car, um, um, it's, it's really going to be amazing and, and, and changing those timeframes of, of what the future is going to look like. Um, discussion on uh, driverless cars is a, is a, is a big topic globally. Um, and um, uh, given the support of the government and um, um, uh, the Adelaide City Council, we're hosting the International Driverless Car Conference um, in November this year, along with the um, Australian Driverless Vehicle um, de de demonstrations on the Southern Expressway. Um, if you're wanting to come along, um, learn more about this, this um, uh, fantastic technology, go to our web website, have a look, have a read up about it, and um, look at some of the great international speakers we've got coming over and some of the um, concepts we're going through from um, uh, not just the technology, but the, um, the legislation side, the philosophical side, um, and also bring in some of the other, um, other industries which have t moved to this space, such as um, um, the aviation industry, which has taken that step to driverless um, some time ago. Thank you. And so with that, we now move into the big idea part of uh, today's session. So um, what we'll do, the way we'll work, is, work this is that we'll have, there's three sort of hypothetical ideas, and the Lord Mayor stole some of my thunder, actually, talking about some of those ideas. But to begin with, the first hypothetical. So as we've learned, the idea of cars operating without people in them isn't as far away as we think. And we've talked about the fact if our vehicles can drop us off, drop us off Leave us, leave, then leave the city area altogether potentially or find alternative storage locations, what opportunities then might be presented if cars are no longer required to be parked in the CBD were not being used? What does that mean, as the Lord Mayor said, for on-street and off-street multi-storey parking? How would this impact the way in which we design our streets? And then further to that, the interface of our buildings to the footpath and the idea of pedestrianising the city and empowering pedestrians once again. Um, what might it mean for our development plans as well and the living requirements in the city? So. Perhaps maybe David, you could start off and have a, you know, start the conversation about what you think on all that. <laughs> Sorry to throw you in the deep end. <laughs> oh, it is on. Ah, oh, oh. high tech. Don't to do anything. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Dino, for throwing that to me. That's what I get for being prayers, isn't it? <laughs> Look, um, it's an interesting thing. Just. Imagine the whole sequence of how you get into and get out of your car at a destination. And we design buildings um, and we design the road network to support those processes. Um, often that's effectively based on being able to park a car either in front of your destination uh, or immediately adjacent to it or not too far away, then you get out and walk to it. And I was thinking a little bit about this um, if you take retail, for example, and it's probably not so much in the CBD, although there are some areas where uh, the way that retail traditionally does it, retailers want to see plenty of car parks out the front. You, you know the model, you drive down uh, Anzac Highway and Carolta Park has a sea of cars out in front of it. And that's because that's good retail theory, because people want to be able to see that they can get a park and actually get there. Imagine what that might be like um, if you can get to the front door of the supermarket or whatever, get out of your car, take your shopping bags and the car disappears on its own. Do we actually need um, that sea of car parks out the front of our retail centres or do we just basically need a really big um, port cashier type arrangement instead? And if you just think about movements within supermarkets, how many people are actually in the supermarket and how many are actually going into it and leaving at the same time and they're the sort of people that you're catering for. So the spatial implications of how um, what a car that can drop you off and then depart and then eventually come back again uh, I think are really really interesting. Suddenly we can you know there's almost a return to high street shopping instead of big box retail. Um, that's one potential scenario. Anyone else have any comments? 
Um, in terms of the, the safety implications for that, in terms of um, shopping centre car parks, um, that mixed use zone, um, we had the uh, tragedy on the weekend at um, uh, Tea, Tree, Tea Tree Gully, I think it was. Um, uh, and um, those sort of tragedies are continuing to ha happen around Australia. And if we can um, remove that um, crossover between uh, light vehicles and pedestrians, um, those sort of immediate safety implications, safety implications and the benefits um, could certainly come through and, um, and, and make um, not just our, um, our shopping precincts, but the, um, uh, the Adelaide City Council area and our, um, um, our towns and, and, and where we want to travel and, and walk around a much more pleasurable experience if we're not having to share those zones with um, uh, other vehicles. I think this goes to the nub of car ownership. It's really about whether we own cars in the future. Um, and the reason for that is if you look who's in this space, there's two cohorts of, of, of parties. There's the Google, Uber um, uh, type IT companies who are trying to make cars and then there's traditional car companies who are trying to make autonomous vehicles. And you think, well, why is Uber in this space? Well, Uber is in this space um, because they believe their system is the way that people will uh, access a facility which is a car. Currently they have drivers in them, but ultimately they won't even have drivers in them. So it'll change uh, driverless cars, especially when they come down to the smallest uh, city sort of uh, vehicles, will challenge the notion of even owning your own car and therefore having car parks uh, in any buildings, etc. So it's, yeah, it's a philosophical issue about bigger than just access. Do you know, I think that's, um, that's a really nice point. It it's comes to the sharing economy as well and how quickly we work into the sharing economy and what our models for ownership are. I mean, the car is still most families' second biggest purchase, right, after a house. So I wonder what happens to that sort of own, those ownership models, both around the vehicle and, and the home. So there could be some really, um, some really big things shifting there. Um, another point that Mark made in his presentation that I thought would be interesting at least to capture is, is what we call this, driverless cars or autonomous vehicles. And um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a brand effort to be put around that to get the terminology right. <laughs> yeah. I recall in the early stage of the climate change debate, there was very serious discussion amongst different proponents about whether we call it climate change, because that sounds a bit scary, or whether we call it global warming, because, you know, and I recall one American commentator saying, that just makes everyone think we're all going to move to Florida, yeah, kind of thing. Good. So there is something about the branding or the, the terminology we use around something that requires people or doesn't require people. I just thought it was a good point in Mark's um, presentation that we might pick up later. And maybe if I could, I'd just come back to the idea of the design guidelines and things like that. I mean, given the time frames that we're talking about of how imminent this technology is, do we need to start rewriting some of that stuff and we've got planning reforms currently underway? Has any, like, do we really need to start thinking about how that gets integrated? Yeah, if I can just um, add to that and respond to the first session. I think the audience and your sort of um, vocation group have got a key role to play in um, demonstrating where the benefits are because um, if you can start thinking about what the urban form could look like and um, d demonstrate that and start the conversation, we, we know that the benefits are significant um, from a road safety, from an environmental, but um, to personalise that for, you know, what the shopping centres of the future will look like, how the benefits to the community of, of um, what they'd get back as far as their mobility and their urban living, the investment in buying a car, that money that they won't necessarily need to invest in that, um, in that asset, that can be reallocated to other things. So I think your profession definitely has a key role to play in that. And um, our, our demonstrations in November were essentially in response to the visionary statements made by the Governor and the Premier and the Minister, obviously. Uh, and our role has been to translate that vision into practice and to start the dialogue um, through uh, learning, through demonstrating learning, through um, application that this is a technology that's on our doorstep. And uh, we hope that the first demonstration in the Southern Hemisphere on a road um, will we'll start that dialogue, but it would be really good to see some images coming out of what um, designs could look like that don't require the, the big car parks in the front. Can I take a counter position? Sorry, can you take a... I'm going to take an entirely counter position, which, which is actually coming back to this idea about what we're going to call it, because 
It seems to me if we're talking about the built environment, we should look to some other things that have happened um, in the built environment. And I, I think about workplace design and an acronym which has become almost ubiquitous, which is activity-based working. And I wonder if what we should be calling it is actually activity-based transport, because my gut feel is that the built environment will not look much different at all, that in actual fact what we're talking about is uh, digital disruption, new technologies will actually just allow us to use what we've got really well and employ it in a, in a whole new way. So, you know, the, the, the idea of owning our own car might only be a blip, a hundred year blip on the history of civilization. in that, you know, we know that, you know, for example, um, in a place like London there was like one co-working space a decade ago. And there's something like a thousand such spaces today which are about using buildings in an entirely different way, which increases their usage from something like, you know, 8% of my day at my desk to a desk being used, you know, an exponential amount more. And I, I come back to your earlier point about um, will car ownership, you know, is this the end of individual car ownership? And it, it seems to me the built environment is entirely implicated in that. If universities are using their facilities like, you know, less than 10%, if I'm using my car less than 5% of the time, that this is entirely bound up in the, the whole story about sustainability, which is actually not about more resources, but about using what we've got really well. And cars seem to be entirely um, kind of bound up in this. That's a perfect segue. So the idea is that, as we've talked about, you don't need to own a car anymore. I mean, for all of you here, you, if you own a car, what's it currently doing right this minute? It's sitting there not doing anything. Maybe you think about the fact that you have to pay for a car 24 hours of every day, you might only use it for one. So what opportunities does that throw up for us if we no longer have to own a car? And the idea of car sharing, and specifically I'd like to talk about what that might mean for suburbia and families, and you touched on that, Megan, as well. So, you know, how might that completely reimagine how we design our homes and the interface of the home to the street? Um, you know, what do we do with all those redundant double garages that seem to be everywhere that Peter Gers likes to talk about all the time? So, like... You know, what does it also mean for housing affordability? No longer do we have to build 36 square metres of double garage. Um, and how might, you know, as I said, how, how might this impact the way we engage the street? So maybe, who wants to go first? You look like you want to go first, Megan. Well, I think, I think um, the architectural and urban design communities have spent a lot of time, not, not, ex not uniquely, but a lot of time railing against suburbia. Um, there's been long discourse around what was wrong with suburbia. Partly it was the social isolation, so we had a discussion around the green prisons. Um, then it was um, the productivity um, issues around long commutes and, and, and non-productive time. And then, you know, the real clincher was the carbon footprint impact, you know, the, the impact of our transport, the necessary transport solutions to make suburbia work. And it occurs to me that if if the um, autonomous vehicle and electric vehicle it, um, technologies do come together in the way it seems they, they must, most of those fundamental arguments against the suburban model start falling away. So I'm sure there's a solution for the double garages that's easier to find. I think, first of all, we might need a big discussion at a, at a, as, as architects, urban designers, city planners, around how we're going to reframe the debate on suburbia. Because if we decouple the suburban development model from environmental destruction, which has kind of been a very handy tool to talk about how bad suburbia is in a lot of um, fora, that, um, I think, becomes a pretty different debate. And then there's the reciprocal debate to be had about inner city. Yeah, when I was thinking about that, <coughs> that particular issue um, and talking among some colleagues at Hassel, one of the things that they raise is that it might actually counterintuitively create urban sprawl, um, which is, uh, I guess, exactly Megan's point, because um, the reason the ci our cities are as they are is because the cars shape them. The car's about convenience. That's why public transport is sort of down the order, in t and particularly in Western or in, uh, in Australian cities. Um, so by creating more convenience, that means you can actually be further out, potentially. Uh, the car can be a space where you're actually doing work, you're conducting your office business on your way to work. Um, so counterintuitively, we might need less public transport and actually um, increase the footprint of our cities. 
What that means from a, um, a carbon footprint point of view, I've got no idea. Um, it depends on where they source their energy from. Um, I think uh, in some, you know, if you look at mass transit, I can't, spatially I can't see how a car or a bunch of autonomous cars can actually move as many people as a uh, as high speed rail still, um, because just the, you know, the footprint that they take up. Um, but I do think we've got to be careful that we don't end up with a counterintuitive thing coming about where we end up increasing um, our urban footprint and all the carbon issues that go that are associated with that as a result of this technology. I wonder if it's back to who owns the cars. So if we convince Jay to buy all the cars and the only way in which autonomous cars come onto the road is through um, a kind of collective, not to be horribly socialist, but kind of some collective idea about the ownership of cars such that they're all owned by, you know, collectively by the government, then, um, then the problem becomes kind of redundant in that they become their own public transport system in, in, in various, you know, aspects of the city or various parts of the city. Mm. Yeah, you guys Is that are... possible? No, um, well, I've just got back from Bordeaux and um, mobility as a service is a key word and we're hearing that mobility, you know, car companies are going to become mobility providers. So um, we're seeing in Finland, um, supported by the Finland government, that people can start purchasing um, mobility as a service the same way as they purchase a contract for mobile phones and you can spend up to 1,200 euros a month, depending on the level of access you want to a private vehicle. If you want it on call at five minutes or 15 minutes wait, if you want to get free access to public transport, you purchase that as, um, as a package. And so those sort of mobility packages um, with service providers, and I think that's quite important because I think the two um, speakers just before have talked about the technologies happening, that sort of stuff, the innovation is happening, the car manufacturers are leading this, it's a competitive advantage, so they're very motivated to lead this, and we've got other players like Uber and Google and GoGet and all those little sort of shared providers. They're, they're taking care of that, and we've heard the Volvo CEO just last week say, if, we, if it's our technology, we'll take the liability for it. So all of this debate about who's responsible for crashes, you know, that's going to be sorted. What we just need to embrace now is that, you know, what are the impacts and, you know, that sort of philosophy about um, suburbia versus, you know, regional locations, you know, that's another disrupt disrupted business model and a disrupted, you know, ideology. And so you need to get understand that. And electric vehicles and auto automated vehicles are converging. It's definitely a converging uh, with the Tesla sort of, it's much easier to uh, upgrade, put updates to an electric uh, vehicle than it is to, you know, the standard vehicle. So those two things will converge. And one of our key partners is AGL and, you know, they're, they're, they're just looking at hybrid and electric vehicles and how they, and they'll be part of our future demonstrations as well. And we want to have that green flavour to the demonstration. So we were trying to get a Volvo hybrid vehicle to come out, um, but we weren't able to do that. So that, that will be the next stage. And that's the dialogue we want to have is with our demonstrations. Can I, oh, sorry. Can I just throw another thought about suburbia out there as well? Who noticed uh, Monday morning when you were heading to work, what happened on our road system? Kids were back at school. Kids were back at school, and the traffic was a nightmare. Now, um, just imagine if you're not owning a car, um, you can dial up uh, for the car to turn up at your house, take your kids to school. You can go in the opposite direction to work, because I suspect a lot of those trips are all about kids, uh, parents taking their kids across town to drop them at school, then coming back the other way to get into the city. Uh, and, you, you know, the... Um, the road network is almost designed for oh, 30 weeks of the year um, where we don't actually need it that much. And a lot of the chaos is actually around the schools. Those of us that actually ride bikes to schools, they're probably the most dangerous part of the trip is actually getting literally the last couple of hundred metres to the school. So if you've got... Um, uh, you don't have an ownership issue, that means you can dial up the vehicle to get your kids to school or you can ride them there safely. Um, while people are making uh, trips elsewhere. So that's a very different model as to how we actually design suburban schools or even inner, inner urban schools as well, um, quite different. I think uh, just taking that concept a little bit further, it's also linking with the intelligent transport systems and um, uh, linking in our, our, our daily planning to, to how we operate. Um, 
having a system within our phones, within our ITS infrastructure. If um, we wake up on a Monday morning, our alarm might be set for 10 minutes earlier um, because it knows the traffic's bad and it knows we've got a meeting to attend at, at 9 a.m. in the morning. Um, or it might um, let us sleep in and say, you know what, you're not going to make your 9 a.m. meeting, Matt. The traffic's really crap today because the kids <laughs> are back. Um, so, um, you know, uh, go, to, go to the video, video conferencing room um, in your home. Um, in terms of all these technologies converging, it, it's really going to change um, how we operate over the next um, couple of decades. And I think it's really exciting to, to have a bit of a broader look just um, beyond the vehicle and the transport as well. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm sorry, you, you go. Just to, just to throw another spanner in the works, um, <laughs> electric vehicles are increasing. But uh, interesting, you'll see that uh, uh, with the range of vehicles now, the Tesla has car-like range, and it'll do five, uh, five, 600 kilometres. On a charge, what you're starting to see now is uh, the car becoming integrated into the house electrical and d distribution system is the, basically the UPS uninterrupted power supply for houses too. So you, you're going to see the car not just having one role, but during, um, uh, during uh, the peak of summer from when the kids come home from school, the car running the air conditioning in the house, those sort of integration issues are, are out there as well. So it's, yeah, it's a complicated world we're about to move into. And that's why we're here and we're talking about it. So, um, I mean, you guys all touched on it, but the third hypothetical um, scenario revolves around that argument, you know, is it the public transport or is it a whole new thing that we haven't really fully understood yet? The idea of a private transport network, if you know, the government decides to um, and make it could be a stimulus package and we could open Holden again, we can build lots of cars back in Adelaide. So um, you know, how, how, how might the driver's car perhaps enable us to use public transport more in the interim, the idea of those nodes that you talked about, um, Mark? Or whether or not, yeah, we might see private car sharing models becoming a new normal and you know, what does that mean for our current transport infrastructure? And you know, should we be doing things now to future-proof the large investments we're making in infrastructure projects? Anyone? Another question, and what happens in transition between now and the future? Um, is, does this become a risk around siphoning off the very small market share that, that public transport has at the moment mm. to make it viable? Um, and what's the gap between, um, between our current model and a future model? That's not an answer, it's just another no, question. So I don't know. <laughs> Well, I think um, public transport, um, the, what we were hearing from uh, Europeans is that it'll be shared transport, essentially. Um, whether you have, you're the only person that accesses it at the same, you know, are you sharing it at the same time as somebody else or are you sharing it at other times when you're not using it? But it'll be a shared transport model and we can open up the players of who owns those sorts of mobility services. Um, instead of dealing with multiple owners, individual owners, you might deal with about three or four uh, vehicle owners who run this, these fleets. But you as an individual, uh, personally, you still get the same accessibility that you're willing to pay for. Um, so I think that, that that's definitely happening. And I think there's, there's a role for governments in that public transport sector, um, but it'll be different to what we're seeing now. We're seeing last mile issues as far as the interaction. If we talk about CBDs and also somewhere like Tonsley University precincts, um, where you've got you know, people arriving en masse through um, trains or some other mass transit uh, or parking their cars in a parking area and then how they get to their destination. And we're seeing these shuttles, these automated shuttles. Uh, that technology is, you know, is evolving and I think with the universities that we've got here in South Australia and also around Australia, that technology that's been primarily invested in looking at mining operations and automated or autonomous mining vehicles. There's a lot of that technology and, and smarts in Australia already. And uh, I think as part of this, we'll see a lot more students and a lot more PhD and, um, and also training up our executives to understand what the benefits are for them to get involved. So I think the last mile issues uh, is definitely a shared transport issue. And maybe some of those other you know, nodes might still be a private uh, access or individuals in cars and families in cars. So, sorry, are you suggesting something maybe perhaps that on the periphery of the parklands we could end up with a whole series of public transport interchanges that just then ferry the pe people into the city? Is that the sort of thing that we're well, talking about? Well, you could, um, I mean, you've got to have an integration. I think you mentioned about what, is, what do we do in the, um, in, in, when well, we've got a mixed use of mm. automated and, you know, humans driving. 
and uh, this is pretty key and that's what a lot of our uh, behavioural science research is ha happening. That's the human machine interface, HMI, more acronyms. Um, those are key things that we need to understand and a lot of that's been done through simulators um, and I think there's a role for the simulation to, you know, to see how humans react but there's also a role to have some field trials and um, uh, trials of how, how um, humans react with this technology. Um, when they're faced with it. So that's something that we'll be leading as well. Uh, and essentially this sort of last mile would be this sort of automated sh shuttle. I think Mark mentioned, you know, the airports, they're mm. all, you know, they're getting bigger and bigger and, you know, parking's further away. There's a lot of rental cars that are, you know, you have to go to the rental car, drop off your car and then go to catch your plane. I mean, why wouldn't they be an early adopter of an automated parking, valet parking, where you drop your vehicle off at some convenient location, then it goes and parks itself, you know, mm. safely. So there are going to be some early adopters because there's a commercial advantage. Mm. And we're, you know, the vehicle manufacturers, the technology people, they're working on the technology. We, I think we don't need to. We need to keep an eye on it. We need to understand it. Um, but I don't think, you know, we just need to understand where we're going to get the benefits from it. Yeah, I was just going to maybe, Megan, sorry to come back to you again, but perhaps something like Tonsley presents that opportunity. Mark talked about the desensitisation and maybe that's an example, but does Tonsley, from a, even from a branding perspective, what that would mean for that precinct? Um, you know, the idea of making that an autonomous node and then from there the opportunities to then link to Flinders University and have those shuttle runs and that integration, is that something that could be a possibility? Um, yeah, definitely. I certainly wouldn't preclude any, any of those things. I think the idea of using some of... Um, government's investments in one area, so that's about the redevelopment of a site, but using, um, using those sorts of investments to piggyback other opportunities is, a, is, an, important, um, is an important part of government's role in this kind of development. So mm. in large part, what Tonsley is trying to do is um, it's, a, it's government playing a role of sort of civic leadership, demonstrating what a new working environment might look like mm. in, in our case for you know, high value manufacture. Um, that's, that shouldn't mean it doesn't extend to the prototyping opportunities around new technologies and demonstration facilities, much the same way as um, Lord Mayhase was talking about, you know, Adelaide CBD as a, as a city of firsts or as a prototype kind of location. There's no reason why other strategic sites couldn't play that role as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I could see, like, just the potential of even... I understand that there's a residential component attached to that as well. So, you know, that could in itself be a testing bed for how we might start to have that exploration of the integration of these types of cars with residential living and that could further you know highlight the benefits of Tonsley. Yeah and, and so it's then then it's about all the digital systems it's mm. about how digitally irrigated the the site is to allow all those sorts of um, uh, opportunities to, to play and it might be autonomous vehicle but it also might be um, digitally connected housing that mm. supports you know aging in place I mean there are a whole there are a whole range of examples for for that so mm. yeah cool and did anyone else have anything to add? I just want to say, in that precinct, uh, earlier this year we spoke to Minister Mulligan uh, and he was suggesting what type of uh, trials could you have that would expose people to it. And had a, you've got an, an ideal opportunity with Tonsley. It, it's um, a campus uh, sort of marooned a bit from the main university, but more importantly, they're about to spend a billion dollars worth of infrastructure in between those two sites. And this is the time to at least uh, getting that thinking in about how you can uh, you know, at least accommodate shuttles if they come. Yeah, the the um, the public transport versus private transport thing is an interesting one. Um, in that, I reckon it's going to be a city by city proposition. So, if you take a city like Singapore, um, incredibly dense, it will probably remain a lot more efficient to shift people by train and build the mass rail infrastructure that they've been doing. If you look at Adelaide, though, it might actually make more sense to invest more heavily in roads because of the way the city is laid out, that it's actually more efficient to uh, bite the bullet, jam our roads full of uh, autonomous vehicles um, and not have trains that shift a few people, you know, during the peak hour and then a lot of the rest of the time they're not actually being well utilised. It's not like a city like Singapore where the, the train system is the way of getting around. So that might drive actually how we invest um, in our, uh, in what infrastructure we do and it might vary from city to city. I think that's a, a really important thing that we're going to have to unpack and explore a lot more. I think that's a really great proposition because it actually comes back to um, uh, human beings driving the driverless car, as it were, or driving what we do with them because it's actually 
uh, comes back to a sustainability question of how we do, how we move more people in the most efficient way based on the, the type of city that we've, that we've inherited as a result of plans a thousand years old, a hundred years old and, and everything, everywhere in between. So, anyone? Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, um, Singapore, I think yesterday on the 12th, um, is actually one of the leaders in this space and they were going to have four demonstration sites as well of automated, highly automated vehicles. And um, that some of the work that they did about their whole, their island, their precinct, was that in a shared um, automated vehicle space, they would see there'd be 30% less vehicles on the road with the way that that would... So they can, they can see that there's a huge benefit for them um, in, in investing in this. And they're one of the, so of the lead governments that are sort of fostering this and, and encouraging development of uh, automated trials um, in, in Singapore. So... Um, yeah, it, it, uh, Tonsley, uh, Flinders University, they're one of our partners, Flinders University and Tonsley through the state government. We've had a number of um, discussions about how the existing tenants of that site plus others, the, um, how, how that could be part of the... Um, but as far as infrastructure is concerned, and Mark mentioned the billion dollars they're spending down south, there's the um, Northern Connector, which has just been announced. And, you know, when road designers and planners uh, plan a road network, they don't expect it just to last 20 years. They're, they're planning a road for 50 years, um, especially one that hasn't even been designed yet or, you know, we're in the process of that. So we think there's huge opportunities with the Northern Connector and that sort of port to, you know, export mm. um, up to the mines and, and, and other areas is that that's a key location that we'd be encouraging government um, to look at how they can link that and make that more efficient transport route. Mm. I think probably what it means is that we have to become a lot more sophisticated at the way that we model our cities um, and the, you know, the, the computer, harnessing computer power to go and test these things hypothetically as scenarios before we go and make decisions on building roads, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I was in Singapore, I saw the Future Cities Lab where they actually have some really interesting stuff that has really quick live modelling of scenarios of what would it mean if you put 40,000 people in a building, oh sorry, 4,000 people in a building in this precinct, how does it affect pedestrian flows, all that type of stuff. I think we we have a really good opportunity here as Adelaide as a laboratory test bed for these sorts of things and it was really good to hear the Premier talk a little bit about that earlier. Um, how we might develop up some of these models to scenario test before we just go and roll things out. I think that's going to be crucial. Um, and what we can't forget um, throughout this, this, this whole um, uh, future state is, um, um, and being a South Australian and, and being a bit of a car nut, is, is all, uh, all South Australians, or you know, a, a high proportion of them, like their car and, and like to personalise their vehicle. Um, and there's, there's, there's great interest... Um, um, for a number of years now to, uh, to have your own car and tailor it to your own needs um, and, and also not share that with others. Um, many carpool initiatives have been, have been out there and proposed and there's, there's current carpool initiatives happening now but um, unfortunately the um, <laughs> community is not willing to share um, and I guess it, yes it must be, it, it could be way more efficient for uh, driverless cars and um, um, having that future car share arrangement going forward but what will the community want to do? What will they want to give up? Um, and uh, I think that's another, another thing to sort of have a bit of a think about. Hmm. On that, we might, um, I'm just conscious of time and thank you all for, for sitting for so long. Maybe we'll, if there's any questions from the audience, now would be the opportunity to do that um, while you've got the panel up here. Is anyone that has a question? I've got a microphone here. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. I'm Sophia McRae, I'm councillor at Norwood Paynham St Peter's and uh, we've just been discussing and looking at... Uh, how the government in, in some of its planning reforms is uh, wanting to have less car parking provided um, for the reasons of reducing car dependency. So it's something I've got a lot of interest in as a student planner and as a cyclist. And so something I'm missing that's missing from this conversation is what the implications of um, autonomous cars will be on our urban form in terms of public health because we've had a very strong message coming from state government policy about the importance of more active transport for our public health. And it seems to me that if uh, autonomous vehicles are encouraged, that's actually 
not going to achieve those outcomes of public health. It's not going to be encouraging people to walk more or ride more because instead they can just sit in this autonomous vehicle. So I'm just wondering what the panel's got to say about that. Um, I, was, I was thinking about that issue um, in a roundabout way just prior to this and one of the interesting things from a cyclist point of view, and I'm, I'm a cyclist, is that the majority of people who don't ride don't ride because it's not safe. Um, that's their perception. So um, maybe there's a way of arranging things so that autonomous vehicles, I believe, would inherently make cycling safer uh, because you're not relying on the judgment of somebody behind a wheel uh, and to do the right thing to actually work at, you know, so that you can safely navigate your way through the city. So it could turn out that cycling actually is a safer activity um, and therefore people who are, um, don't have great distances to commute, um, the chosen mode of transport cycling, um, whereas you're using autonomous vehicles to, to commute longer distances. Um, so if we play that out, that making cycling safer, I think this, it's a big statistic, it's like 50 or 60 per cent would ride um, if it was actually safe to do so. So you might find that it actually um, resolves a couple of those issues. I think um, that's a great question and this speaks to what is the role of government and regulators and legislators and we know, you know, we hear about what Google's doing but Google doesn't, isn't sharing what they're doing. You know, they're making decisions about how they program their vehicle and the decisions that the vehicle's going to make in relation to, you know, who's it going to give priority to, how is it going to look at, you know, the unexpected um, child that crosses the road or, or those are the computer programmers and um, their behavioural scientists on their in their fact you know in their technology area are making those decisions. Um, so essentially, if we had a scenario where there was a you know an overarching international standard that said you know the vulnerable road user, the cyclist, and the pedestrian have to have priority, so all these vehicles are going to be programmed to you know that they'll have a decision of how they uh, react with that uh, sort of um, vulnerable road user then it will be much safer and those complex decisions that the humans make and many times get wrong based on the aggressive driving nature they'll they'll be eradicated so i think that's clearly um a benefit but we're not there yet and we need to get all the companies um talking to one another but at the moment it's a very competitive space and so they're sharing up to a certain point of how they're programming these decisions in their automated vehicles but that that will definitely come and that's probably a, a leadership role for um, the regulators and on an international platform. So were there any um, other questions from the floor? No? Okay well unless anyone else had anything else to add? No? Uh, just about the, yeah. uh, the safety of driverless cars. Um, uh, driverless cars and the testing and the feedback we've got back from, from Google and so on is that driverless cars are inherently very safe drivers um, and um, uh, haven't been involved in many, many crashes at all. The, uh, the experience from Google they've provided us is they've completed between three and four million uh, miles uh, travelled in uh, the driverless cars across the US um, and at last count uh, they were involved in 16 crashes um, and each and every one of those crashes, it was a, a driven vehicle that crashed into the Google car. Um, and one of the challenges outcoming of, the, uh, of that is that um, maybe the driverless cars are, are a little bit too cautious in how they operate. Um, and that's, a, that's another sort of stage that people like Google and the vehicle manufacturers are going through, of how to, how to manage that sort of process as well. Um, but in terms of the safety of these uh, driverless cars, um, great feedback we've got back is, is that yes, they are inherently safe. And, um, um, uh, they, they, can, they can see and sense far more things than just the simple um, human eye or the dist distracted human eye behind the wheel. Okay. And so with that, that uh, brings to an end Future Forum. I thank you all for um, coming along and um, participating. Um, thank you to the Premier and to the Lord Mayor, to our panellists, to Mark. Uh, going through this, Mark, Matthew, Rita, Megan, David and Cameron. Thank you so very much. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the Adelaide Town Hall, um, Paul Elliott, uh, Novatech, uh, the RAA, Starcraft for providing us with our furniture for the, um, the afternoon, and also to the Jam Factory um, for providing us with some gifts for you all. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Steve, Paul and Dimity, my employers at Grieve Anderson, and also to Architectural Window Systems again for their ongoing support.